Good morning. We are in 1 Peter, and if you have a Bible or if you want to grab one in the uh, seat back in front of you, we're, it's page 588. We're reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25, page 588 in the Bible in the seat back. And I also want to remind you, if you're... Um, If you've started the scripture memorization, it's in chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. But we are reading from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. Here we go. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. You may be seated. And this is the word of God. Amen. I'm, I'm glad to be with you today. Pastor Emmanuel has taken us through a, a couple sermons so far, and we're in our Stand Firm series of First and Second Peter. We'll be in for several weeks. And our memory passage, for those of you that like competition maybe, um, there are, uh, I've heard, ten small gifts uh, for those that can come and recite to Pastor Emmanuel. First Peter chapter 5, 6 through 11. And if you haven't done that yet, and I have not either, um, the first part of that passage starts with humble yourselves. So, if we haven't yet, that's just a reminder that we can be humbled, and it's okay. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. But we're, today we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 uh, through 25, and we're going to start getting into the meat of Peter's message to the dispersed churches of Asia Asia Minor. And the main takeaway from today's passage is that our conduct as Christ followers should be holy. Our conduct should be holy. So today I want to share with you what it means to be holy and the why behind that. You might have remembered from last week, Pastor Emmanuel left us with a, a nugget of to take away. Faith should inspire conduct. So sometimes we are often focused on what we see on the outside, the conduct, the manifestation, the, the, the outcome. But do we ever ask ourselves, what is causing that? Maybe that's a question we should be asking ourselves. What is driving our conduct? What has driven my conduct this week? Could it be the pressures of wanting to be accepted? Could it be pleasing people? Could it be the trappings of an addiction even? Or another form of distraction from how God designed us to be. He created us to worship Him, not to worship other things. And that is a question that we should be asking ourselves. Are we a Christ follower? Number one. And if we are, what is inspiring our conduct? So I want to do something a little bit different. And instead of going from the top down in the passage and 13 through 25, and kind of exposing what God has got for us this morning. 
I want to jump down to verse 22 because it is talking about a special kind of love. Maybe it's a little bit different than what we think of when we think of the word love. It says in verse 22, if you've got your Bibles there, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. What does this mean, this phrase, pure heart? So let's talk about that, that purity, that pure love a little bit. And I'm going to give you just a little story from um, my family and I um, traveling this summer. Took a, took a trip, and as we sometimes do when we're traveling and on vacation, if we have an opportunity to go to a church that's nearby, uh, we, what we did, and there was a tent revival, if you've ever seen those. Um, and we haven't been to very many of those, probably a couple in my life. And they were on their final day, happened to be a Sunday, and we saw two Christian brothers who, when they came to each other to greet, they exchanged kisses on the cheek. Have you ever seen this before? And I don't think this is a very common thing. And two Christian brothers who had a depth of brotherhood that was represented by that kiss. And that kind of was new to us. And when we think of a kiss, we think of something maybe between a married couple, between parents and small children. We don't necessarily think of two brothers or sisters. And 1 Peter 5, actually, at the very end of this letter, he talks about this, and he says to greet each other with a holy kiss. We're not covering that today, but I want you to think about what would inspire such a thing. And another thing I want to leave you with today, and if you read through 1 Peter, and I would encourage you to do that, we actually read that two weeks ago together as an entire church, right here on a Sunday morning, the entire 1 Peter. And I think it could read, our, our danger might be to read it like a how-to guide or how to, how to do life. Um, but really, it should be a why should guide. Why should we be having the conduct that we do? And what would be the point of it being a how-to anyway? If, if it was just a how-to guide, then would we even need faith? Would we need the gift of grace? Would we need each other to be held accountable? As brothers and sisters, we should be doing that. We should be in love, calling each other out if we see an error or something that needs to be addressed. So as we go through this book, I want us to remember, and you'll hear more about this over the next several weeks, that it is constantly putting the why behind every form of conduct. So I encourage you to look at that when you look at this passage. So whether it's husbands and wives, brothers and sisters in churches, submitting to a government even, government authority, the why behind that, the reason for it, and that is because of our submission to Christ and the design that God has. Working together as employees and employers is in there too. The experience of suffering, how we conduct ourselves when we are suffering great loss, when we're experiencing great joy. Generosity, giving to others, caring for others, the list goes on. So I hope that starts to answer the question about something as simple as a holy kiss between two Christian brothers. But let's keep digging. There are some fascinating things um, in that first chapter we don't have time to address today. Angels, prophecy of the men of old looking for a Savior, wondering who that would be. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You can certainly dive into those things. Uh, but today I want to focus on the major themes of this letter, faith and conduct. In order to motivate us to pay attention, let's think about um, who this letter was from. Of course, it's inspired by God. Peter is the author that God uses. And thinking about the idea of receiving a letter in the mail, okay? If you look at this that way. Who likes to receive mail? We all do, right? Especially a personal letter. It's kind of a lost art now, actually. And I will say, and I mentioned this in the first service too, there are some folks in this church that are, that is one of their gifts, to write letters of love, of Christian brotherhood and sisterhood 
to to us. And I know some of our kids have received those from some of our some of our leaders, encouraging them uh, to stay strong and keep the faith. And oftentimes, the person that receives that letter, they know who that is and they know what they're about. And so, let's talk about Peter just a little bit as a person. He had been with Jesus as a young man. He had been, and at the point that he is writing this, scholars will say that he's a seasoned apostle. He has experienced a lot of life. He's a missionary. He's a founder of churches. But he has somewhat of a colorful background, a colorful resume, if you will. And uh, when I was many of of your ages, uh, those of you that are in college now, I received a Bible, a Thompson Chain Study Bible, and it is a really thick study Bible. I didn't bring it with me here today. Uh, It happened to be King James Version. And in the back of that, um, there are character um, descriptions of characters in the Bible. And I was reading through that over the past uh, couple weeks, and the way that they had organized that in uh, looking at Peter's background, uh, I thought that was a pretty interesting way of describing him and just highlighting all those things, and I'll read them for you, and they're on the screen too. This will tell us about the author. So when you think about the letter that you receive, let's think about Peter. He was naturally impulsive, tender-hearted and affectionate. And there are verses for all of these things, full of strange contradictions, at times presumptuous, other times timid and cowardly, self-sacrificing, inclined to be self-seeking even. Do any of these things resonate with us? I know they do with me. Gifted with spiritual insight, slow to apprehend the deeper truths, he made two great confessions of his faith in Christ, but he also gave the most cowardly denial of his Savior. He was courageous and immovable. He was called by Jesus to be the rock of the church and the person that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven to, as it says in Matthew 16. Pretty colorful resume, wouldn't you say? Quite the background. But let's be careful not to look at the changed life of Peter and apply that to our own lives. Many of us might look at that and say, well, those things have, I have never experienced those things. I have never had the opportunity to. I've never had the reason to. Or maybe I'm young in my faith. But don't let that mean that God cannot use you. And he won't use you. Because we have access, as we've been singing this morning, access to God, his power, and his love, regardless of where we are in our age and our walk with him. It is an ongoing journey. But as you see in Romans chapter 8, we have that access when we become a follower of Christ, and I'm very thankful for that. And I will say, too, those of you that may be young in your faith or haven't found Christ yet, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he even says, let no one despise you for your youth. So right there we have an example that we don't have to compare ourselves to Peter. And yes, God inspired Peter to write this letter, but God can also use us in our walk by our conduct and building each other up as brothers and sisters in Christ. So, now that we know who this letter is from, imagine that you're one of these churches in the Roman Empire and you're a leader of one of these churches and you have received a letter from Peter and you know who this person is. It's going to be an important thing and you're going to share that with others and that's what they did. And they shared that with the many churches and we, we uh, Pastor Emmanuel talked about that last week, some of the names of those churches and you see in the very beginning of uh, the verse 1 of chapter 1, um, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, the Asia, Bithynia, all of those, all of those places, those churches, and they would have been excited to receive this. And it reminded them that they have a higher purpose, just as it does you and I. And to remember that our eternal home is with Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Our eternal home is with Jesus. But while we're here, we can enjoy that pure love from each other. It gives us a taste of what heaven, of what it will be like. Second Peter 3.13 says, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
And I have to admit, as I was sitting there next to my wife, singing with you all, just listening to the voices, imagining if, if God is going to provide a place for us to all sing together someday, imagining that's just a taste of what that's going to be like. It's pretty awesome to participate in that with you all this morning. So asking ourselves, do we even know what pure Christian love is? Do we desire it? as one outcome or one manifestation of the faith that is driving our conduct. We might think of love today as a kind of a fleeting emotion, a heart sensation, a romantic, inexplicable, exciting, scary feeling. But what verse 22 is telling us about is a sincere brotherly love, loving one another from a pure heart. So I'd encourage you to look at that. So, I don't know Greek, but I, do, I did take the time to look this up, and over the years, the different definitions of love in the Bible, we only have the one English word, but when the, when the scripture was written, there were different words to describe it. So that gives you maybe an, an idea of uh, how faith can influence our conduct from God. There are actually two distinctly different Greek words for love in verse 22. In the first half of the verse, the, the word for love in the Greek is actually Philadelphia, which is the brotherly love. And it is the noun or the attribute of us as Christians that we should exhibit between each other. So when people look at us as brothers and sisters of Christ, they should be able to see that the Philadelphia on us, that should be obvious, that it is not a fleeting emotion and that second part, oh, and the, that actual um, word only appears six times in the entire New Testament. So that part of, of the Bible, only six times, and it's twice in Peter's letter. So you could say that he knows what he's talking about. So now you have a glimpse of brotherly love. In that second part, and you see on the screen there, where it says love earnestly, that is the action or the verb. And this one appears a lot in the text. And we see this in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, when there's a question about what should we do? What are, the, what are the greatest commandments? Love God and to love our neighbor. It's also the same that we see in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, his great love for us. That is the agapeo love. And so I hope that broadens your understanding a little bit about what is behind that that word that outcome that product of our faith and that's just one we had we should have many products of our faith that we will see throughout this letter over the next several weeks if you're not a Christ follower yet i hope you can see the practicality of conduct that is motivated by faith rather than the shallowness and the tiring effort to be a good person with no heart behind it. Proverbs 4.23 says, to guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. And I was sharing in the first service as well that uh, sometimes um, we have a, an outcome that we feel like we have to force. Um, and I was thinking of family photographs that uh, we take sometimes and you get part way in and you just feel like you're pasting the smile on uh, after so long, and you're having to force yourself to, we got to get this photo taken. And it does feel like this is not really coming from the heart. You're kind of waiting for somebody. Has this ever happened to you? We can, all, we can all probably know what this is. And that is what God is trying to show us here through Peter's letter is the motivation behind our, our faith and our conduct has to do with what he has gifted us with. But maybe, as it says in Proverbs 4.23, our faith would be strong if we kept better track of what we were consuming, what is coming in. So when Proverbs tells us, and it is a, it is a, it's a great book to read to gain wisdom in very small nuggets, guarding your heart above all else because it's the source of life. 
And I don't want to bring shame to us, those of us that are struggling with consuming things that we shouldn't be consuming, that we know it's affecting our conduct. That's not what we're trying to do here. That's not what God's trying to do. He wants to deliver us, right? Amen? From Give us freedom once and for all through his son. And I'm grateful to see that Peter, he also acknowledges the failings of his brothers and sisters. So this is not a new thing. So even though we may feel like we're failing today, this is not a new thing. And he is giving us the encouragement to stay strong. Verse 15 says, All of our conduct, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. That's a very tall order. And I think there's a potential to struggle on the individual sins as to what needs to be corrected in our conduct and to focus on that, that outcome. But are we asking ourselves if we're even acknowledging the faith, the reason for being good, not just to be good because that's what other people want to see. We might even be prone to ranking our sins and ordering them, what is the worst one um, that I need to address and focus on? We each know what those might be, and God can speak to us. They may even be hidden or, or embarrassing. There may be other shortcomings that keep us from meeting the mark that God is calling us to by the reading of this letter. Could it be possible that we could be holy in all of our conduct? Is that even possible? That's what 15 says. We should be driven to seek this outcome because of the faith that we were given. And surprise, I don't think it's actually humanly possible. Is that correct? Would you say it's not humanly possible? And it is. But it is possible through God. Verse 17 uses the phrase, conduct yourselves with fear. So should we be afraid of God? Or should, should, we, should we look at God as a schoolmaster that is constantly correcting us and we will never measure up? That's not what he's saying either. The word there actually comes from a word that means respect. So it's a, it's a fear and respect. It's a healthy fear. It is not a condescending or a condemning fear. That's a respect. And that, compl that should completely change the motivation for our holiness. It's not a shallow emotional fear. So we just talked about our understanding of a shallow emotional love. We're also seeing that we should be operate out of a depth of respect for God. We were just singing about that this morning. Being holy in all of our conduct is possible only with God. So the churches that received this letter included Christians that were living in the expanse of the Roman Empire, what's now Turkey. And they were spread all around. They were known as the Christ Ones. So if you can imagine that kind of hyphenated Christ Ones. And they were sometimes few and far between, and they were known not to honor Caesar and not to buy the idols that were being made for them to worship. And they had objects and idols to worship, little, little gods. And there were people that had businesses that produced these idols that the Christ ones were expected to buy, but they didn't. And so they had to hide. They had to worship on their own. They had to find places to worship. They, they experienced the persecution that we do not experience here. Peter uses the phrases in, in chapter 1 that we should be different than the passions of our former ignorance and different than the feudal ways inherited from our forefathers. And he's speaking to these churches. These churches contained Jews and Gentiles. So they would have been people that had to leave their godly homeland, combined with people that were converted Romans or Gentiles. They weren't Jews, they were Gentiles. So it's a combination of the two. And notice that Peter didn't call out specific sins. He was more concerned about the motivation behind the action. 
So he could have had a letter that talked about the, the things that he saw that needed to be dealt with. But instead, he wrote a general letter to focus on their motivation, what is behind those outcomes. So maybe you are a people pleaser, and I have tendencies that way myself. Make, I want to make other people happy. I want to make people around me comfortable, happy with me. Maybe your faith is weak. If so, then First Peter is for you and for me. But if you're not a people pleaser, if your faith is not weak, would you please pray for the rest of us? Because we're in this together, right? Early in my family life, when Heather and I were uh, younger parents, uh, we had the blessing of being part of a community group. And if you're not part of one, I would encourage you to do that. Or a life group, uh, um, a small group. There's different names for them in the various churches. And we've got several here. And we always need leaders for those, by the way, if you're looking to help start one. The couple leading the group, this was in Kentucky many years ago, uh, early in our marriage. And I don't think we even had kids at the time. But they shared this story um, about their four-year-old daughter and her unwillingness to comply, but she eventually did. And um, she had a strong will, as many children do, and as many of us do. This sometimes doesn't go away, right? We, we can be determined. And this four-year-old was told to sit down over and over and over, and eventually she complied. And um, her statement as a four-year-old was, when she sat down, I'm sitting down, but I'm standing up on the inside. And that always stuck with me and I, that came to mind as I was preparing for the sermon uh, today because it tells us a lot about our nature. Are we just doing what others want us to do because it's pleasing them? What is motivating us? Her heart hadn't been changed yet, and uh, she's a work in progress like many of us. So I always enjoy that memory. You may be familiar with the author, uh, Paul David Tripp, and if you're not, I would encourage you to get uh, one of his books. He and his brother both are authors, Paul Tripp. Uh, there was a book that uh, he wrote, and he has shared this, uh, this in uh, various conferences. I've heard it. I think you can look it up even on, online. But his book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, by Paul Tripp, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, he talks about fruit that our lives bear. And this idea of fruit uh, comes from Matthew chapter 7. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20. It says, To beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And so I, many of us are not prophets and are not claiming to be false prophets, but I think this next section still applies to us. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Of course not. You would get a fig from a fig tree, right? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So thinking about its roots, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So that is where he's getting that um, from. And he talks about this apple tree that he had in his backyard that was producing fruit that just wasn't, it wasn't very healthy. It was kind of shriveled up apples. Uh, they never really looked very good. They would fall off early. They never really ripened. And he got the idea that he would go and buy some nice shiny apples at the store and staple them onto the tree branches. And then his, he and his wife would both be happy. They could look out the patio window and see that their tree was doing well. And uh, that worked for a little while, uh, but obviously those, uh, those fruits wouldn't stay on there, and they would never come back. They weren't connected to anything. So Psalm 1 talks about this too, about the person that is firmly planted and their fruit shows it. Matthew 7 tells us this, that the fruit should be authentic. So how did we get to the point of an authentic, holy conduct? We should look at our actions or outcomes and ask ourselves, what caused us to do that, or why did we do that? A few years ago, I was very moved by a friend who had gone through a difficult time in his marriage. 
that God pulled him through. He asked himself, and he shared this many times with us uh, in our group, he asked himself the question of motivation behind his action. Every single action that he was taking in every single waking hour. And I was really moved by that. Um, and I'm not saying that we need such a wake-up call for marriage trouble to cause us to think about our actions and what the motivation is, but it caused me to think about, are we diagnosing our spiritual life? Are we thinking about what is causing our conduct? Are we seeing fruit? Are we seeing healthy fruit that is connected to roots firmly planted by the waters of God? So, we've got a, um, a diagnostic check here for you. Um, those of you that have cars or you work on cars, you've probably seen a check engine light, okay? And I've got four uh, reminders here for us that Peter gives us right here in these passages in 13 through 25. So, the first one, reminding us of our past condition, Reminding us of what we have come from. What has God delivered us from? Do we want to go back there? Those of us that are children of God? We should ask ourselves that. Reminding us of, in verses 16, 17, 19, the perfection of Christ. That holy, blameless lamb. He was a perfect person that paid the price for our sins. In verse 19. And then finally this passage wraps up by saying, that the word of God is eternal and lasts forever. The idea of words lasting forever is kind of a foreign concept now, I think, but I think God's word shows us that it doesn't matter what else is gone, his word, and there are people around the world that are, are, would love the opportunity to have a Bible of their own. Many do not. Some of us have multiple Bibles, and so... It is a very viable thing. We should cherish it. If you're not a Christ follower yet, then these diagnostics may not mean that much to you, but what would be your standard of measurement? Observations about you by other people? Uh, maybe your own made-up set of rules? That's kind of a popular thing today, to pick and choose little pieces and parts of other faiths and religions and choose what works best for us. Uh, but that is not how God designed us to be. If that is what you, know, you are doing, then how would those faiths compare with Christianity? Or maybe another way to put it is, what would happen if you don't measure up to that standard that either you created or another faith created that a false religion may have set? Who would be there to, to use a fancy legal term, adjudicate the resolution to judge whether you are your conduct is correct. Would it be yourself? I hope not. Wouldn't you rather have a loving creator come to your rescue? Amen? Wouldn't you rather have a loving creator come to your rescue and be that judge? When my wife Heather and I were first married, uh, we discovered, I should say I discovered, within the first year that I brought some baggage into the marriage. And praise the Lord, I was surrounded by some Christian brothers and sisters who knew how to help us. That was almost 23 years ago now. I was ignorant, as it says in verse 14. I needed to be shown what was wrong and why it mattered to Christ. I was saved. I was a child of God at the time. I'm not going to get into the details of what that was, just for the sake of time, because I don't want to distract with what the message is saying this morning about what is driving our conduct. I'm still learning every day how to be Christ-like, and so is my wife. And Together, we seek the Lord. We don't always agree. Surprise! Marriage is hard. Life is hard. But I, I can guarantee you that it's even harder without Jesus. In fact, there is an unbelievable freedom in life when you have a commitment to Jesus, a true life with purpose. And again, I'll reference Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So what does it mean to be holy? This adjective, this idea of holy seems kind of unattainable, doesn't it? We think of a, a priest or a, 
an altar or some set apart thing that uh, we would never be able to be that thing. We would never be able to uh, be as good as that. We would never be that clean. How and why could we ever be instructed to be holy? Doesn't the Bible also say that we are sinners? So why would it also say to be holy? And the answer is, with God, anything is possible. That we can be holy. He is calling us to that. We should be striving for that. So this has really ministered to me over the past couple of weeks as I've challenged myself. And I can already see a difference in my own life as he has challenged me to that. So as I kind of begin to wrap up here a little bit and I go back to that uh, holy kiss between the Christian brothers uh, from the beginning of when I first was speaking. What is it and why does it matter? This is, and I only give you that example of the two brothers kissing each other on the cheek as a, uh, just a thought to remember of what could be motivating that. And we need to begin with the end in mind. That's the reason why. So if that is an outcome that we see occurring, and it actually is, it is recommended by Peter. It's an instruction that Peter gives. Uh, so we may not do that in our culture. We could do something else, a handshake, a high five, but it's an, it's an outcome of that love that is motivated by faith. What is the desired outcome? So if you're a strategic planning person and you want to get to a certain point, or if you're manufacturing something, you want to get to that certain point, what are the ingredients needed to get there. Wouldn't it be amazing if we looked at each other, to give, it, to give another example, and, and we interacted with, the, with each other with the eyes and the heart of Jesus? If we didn't think about what we could gain from the interaction, if our interaction with each other is completely holy, that would be very countercultural, would it not? There is no transaction. We are, our transaction is our love for each other. What if our motivation was to simply seek the benefit of the other person and not our own? This passage leaves us, as I mentioned, with the eternal nature of God's word. It's like this slamming down of the hammer, like a judge in a courtroom, not in a condemning way, not in a way that is to give guilt and shame, and to make us feel like we have no way out, but to remind us that the word of God remains forever, and that is freeing. So stand firm. I encourage you. If we've been elected to be Christ followers, and it uses that very word, chosen, elected, we are made his children, then we've been ransomed and set free from the futile ways of our past. We know what a ransom is, right? That's a high price. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. So I ask you that question once more. What is a holy kiss and why does it matter? It represents a pure Christian love between members of the church, a love that was purchased at a very high price. A love that was purchased at a very high price. I hope that has challenged you today to think about what's motivating your conduct in whatever conduct, and God knows how you're conducting your lives. I do not. But I hope that that has caused you to think about what, what roots are you connected to? What is filling your heart? What are you consuming? And I hope that an outpouring of that can be a love. We can see a love for each other. And that was just one form of conduct. And we'll see many more throughout this letter. So I'm thankful for this letter. And, and I pray that over the next several weeks, and if you're just joining us here today for the first time and, or maybe visiting, I pray that it leaves you with encouragement to know that Peter cared, God cared about the church and there, that is no different than today.
So let's pray and thank God for his word that remains forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you have given us your eternal word. I'm thankful that you have paid such a price for our sins and we have the freedom to walk in your truth, to live and love as you did and as you do. Heavenly Father, I pray for each one in this room that may be struggling uh, with conduct that they don't know how to change, whether it's a marriage or a family or something hidden. Lord, we know that uh, you have given freedom through your Son. And we know, Lord, that in a church that you have given us each other to encourage each other, to lift each other up, not just in our church, but many churches across this community and across our country and our world. Lord, I pray that our churches would be lifted up by encouraging and loving each other, motivated by a heart that is founded in faith, like a tree firmly planted by your waters. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.